Joe Torre's Yankees came out cold in the first round of the playoffs. They look more like a fading old ball club than a proud defending world champion. That is until Mike Mussina took them out in game three and shut down the powerful Oakland A's lineup. From there, they took on a familiar form and reawakened the confidence needed to win their best of five series. Confidence they carried all the way to Seattle, where they faced the Mariners, a team that finished with the best regular season record in history, a team that showed true resilience as they too came from behind to win their division series in five games. Today, they turn to their ace, Freddy Garcia. They turn to the league's most exciting player, Ichiro Suzuki. And to the best DH in baseball, Edgar Martinez, to answer the question, who's the best? Safeco Field in Seattle, Washington. Major League Baseball International presents Game 2 of the American League Championship Series between the world champion New York Yankees and the Western Division champion Seattle Mariners. The home team tonight looking to tie up this best of seven series at one before the whole show goes cross country to Yankee Stadium for the weekend. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Safeco Field. The roof is closed, but we are open for business for Game 2. I'm Dave O'Brien, along with my partner, Rick Sutcliffe. And, Rick, a lot of people were very eager to write off the New York Yankees after they lost the first two games of their series with Oakland in the division series. They came back. They rewrote some more Yankee lore, a new chapter in that very thick history book of great Yankee wins, and they may have started a new chapter here in Seattle yesterday. Well, it was that Mike Mussina, tonight's starting pitcher, that got things going for them in Game 3 against Oakland. And now these New York Yankees have the train on the right track. They have won their last four consecutive postseason games. Hey, the Yankees know how to do it in the first game of a series. This is where they really show their championship pinstripes, don't they? Yeah, they have won nine out of the last ten. First game of the series. Their only loss coming back in 1997 against the Cleveland Indians. This team likes being challenged, as they were in the Oakland series. But even more than that, Joe Torre says, they like being champions. It's been an amazing run. They do not want it to stop here. All right, so the Yankees take game one. Seattle is down in their own home building here at Safeco Field. But they do have their ace on the mound tonight, and a right-hander from Venezuela, Freddy Garcia, an 18-game winner during the season. He also led the American League in earned run average. But maybe some concern here, because for just the second time in his career, first time this year, he's going to pitch on three days rest. Everybody else on this Mariner staff is he is very confident against these New York Yankees, particularly in the postseason. Well, look what he did against the Yankees last season in the ALCS. 2-0 with a sparkling 154 ERA. Those were the only two victories that Seattle managed against New York in falling six games in that division series. Uh, when you're on the topic of aces, the Yankees seem to have one every single time they send a pitcher to the mound. And they've got one in Mike Mussina on the hill tonight. He probably was the best pitcher in Major League Baseball down the stretch, Rick, going 6-1 and one in his last nine starts with a 131 earned run average, and he nearly tossed a perfect game in Boston. Yeah, he didn't get a lot of run support during the course of the year, but with Mike Mussina, years has been with the Baltimore Orioles. Not many big games to be had. Well, a big game in the third game of the division series against Oakland doesn't get a lot bigger. It was do or die if the Yankees had lost. They were out of the postseason. Seven innings, four hits. He threw 100 pitches, and 68 of them were for strikes. Now, the Yankees will pay Mike Mussina $88 million over the next six years for his excellence, but manager Lou Pinella of Seattle is not surprised by that, and he expects a big effort from Mussina. We got good starting pitching. We know that. Our job is to hit their starting pitching. They spend quite a bit of money on it, and it shows. So it's game two coming up. Mucina trying to put the Yankees ahead 2-0. The Mariners down one game, but don't seem too concerned because they have the wizard Ichiro in the lineup. He's trying to work his magic tonight. On just about any postcard you'll find that you'll purchase here in the city of Seattle, you're going to find that famous landmark, the Space Needle, rising up high and looking up over Safeco Field. The roof is closed because there is a threat of rain tonight. But it is not a complete enclosure. We still have kind of an outdoorsy feel, and the temperatures will be in the 40s by the mid-portion of tonight's game. Dave O'Brien, Rick Sutcliffe, with you from Safeco Field. 
Ichiro Suzuki had nothing shy of a spectacular season his first year in the American Major Leagues after dominating Japanese baseball for nine years a 350 batting average 242 hits I think the Yankees however Rick may have solved his riddle keeping him off base that's the way to beat Seattle if you're going to do it and how they solved it was with their advanced scouts they're probably the best in baseball last year they were able to shut down Timo Perez of the New York Mets in the World Series how did they shut down each row the first three at bats they pounded him in and they changed his eye level they made him speed up the swing of his bat they had to start it earlier and when he did that they were able to strike him out in his second at bat he reached base 280 times in 162 games. Pretty staggering, 127 runs scored. Number two in all of Major League Baseball and the toughest strikeout in the majors when it comes to guys who batted over 400 times. He was struck out yesterday, so the Yankees off to a very good start against him. Hey, the designated hitter for the Mariners, Edgar Martinez, not off to a very good start. He's been a terrific heart and soul guy for them for about 10 or 15 years, but it was painful with his groin injury yesterday to watch him play, wasn't it? Yeah, Dave, I talked to him just before tonight's game, and he said he got a shot, an anti-inflammatory medication put into that groin on Tuesday. It really did not help whatsoever until he woke up this morning. He said he's much better, and that's great news for Seattle because watch him trying to go from first to third on this double by Mike Cameron. It's painful to watch. It was all he could do to get there. Had it been somebody else running, you could see Cameron right behind him. It might have been a triple for Mike Cameron, but instead it did not, and Cameron did not score. Now, the Mariners done all right with Edgar out of the lineup, but clearly they'd rather have him in there, a career 320 hitter, who also really peppers tonight's Yankee starter, Mike Mussina, at a 373 pace, and he certainly has plenty of fans here in Seattle, and he has been the guy they call Pops ever since he broke in with them back in 1987. This could wind up being a serious coming out party, though, for the second baseman of the New York Yankees, Alfonso Soriano, who showed off some of his five tools yesterday in the Yankees win. Well, we know a lot about the New York Yankees. We don't know a every seat taken for tonight's game two. And down on the field, the presentation of the colors by the United States Marines color guard. Dave O'Brien, Rick Sutcliffe with you. Thanks for joining us. And tonight, we anticipate a terrific second game. Right-hander Freddie Garcia against right-hander Mike Mussina. Garcia with 18 victories and Mussina with 17 during the regular season. Now we send it to Tom Hutler, the public address announcer. We'll have a moment of silence and then tonight's national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight? O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets awakened, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the
Very well done by Alan Woodrow. As if you couldn't guess, he's a tenor. He's an opera star. A very robust version of our national anthem. The Yankees and the Mariners getting set for the second game of the series. In a series everyone anticipates will come down to pitching. Certainly Andy Pettit was the star yesterday for the Yankees. As he had this Seattle team, the number one hitting team in baseball, no hit into the fifth inning. Rick, you were down inside the Yankee clubhouse shortly before the ball game tonight. You're kind of chatting up some friends and getting some of your homework done and some background information. And it, was, it was difficult for you because everyone was napping on you. They were, they were half asleep. Maybe you'd want to explain that. It really was a much different attitude in that clubhouse tonight than it was yesterday. I think the adrenaline from the Oakland series carried over into yesterday's game. But before tonight's game, they had a movie on the big screen television, a lot of guys laying on couches and on the ground, and about half of them were asleep. So I think that fatigue factor may have set in more tonight than it did yesterday. Well, let's get a look at the Yankee travel schedule over the last couple of days. It is astounding, given where they've come from, New York City, to travel across the country to take on the Oakland A's. Wrapping up that series, they had to go back to Yankee Stadium, clinch game five, then get back on the team charter, and head all the way across country once again to take on the Seattle Mariners for game two, and they arrived at six o'clock in the morning. So here it is, the Yankees postseason travel itinerary, 5,122 miles, 13 hours worth of travel against the Oakland A's. They spent more time in the air than they did on the field. 17 and a half hours of game time and 4,812 miles round trip New York to Seattle, the ALCS. Well, and let's not forget right along with that, all of that happened in just a matter of days. They finished the regular season in Tampa. <laughs> so they had to go from Tampa to New York, New York to Oakland for games three and four, back to New York for game five, to Seattle for game one. But here they are, and they've got that look of a champion. They, they came out in that last three games of the Oakland series. I mean, it, it was like a lion going after a lamb. And they, they got what they wanted. They advanced in the postseason, and here they are again. Derek Jeter's sick to death of putting his tray table in an upright and locked position after all of that traveling. The Mariners haven't had to do quite so much. Their series against the Cleveland Indians got them to the middle part of the country and then back to Seattle. So not as many frequent flyer miles as Freddie Garcia marches out of the bullpen. The 25 year old from Caracas Venezuela about to tow the slab for game two against the very tough Mike Mussina. Now those are tonight's starting pitchers. Let's get a look at the rest of the series coming up. We're about to go back across country ourselves to Yankee Stadium over the weekend for game three Saturday at four o'clock Eastern time. It'll be Jamie Moyer against El Duque. Well, Lou Pinella keeps talking about Freddie Garcia and Jamie Moyer being his best two pitchers. If he can possibly get this series back to Seattle, he likes the Mariners' chances because he would have Garcia again on a full five days rest to pitch game six and his 20-game winner, Jamie Moyer, for game seven if needed. Well, of course, the real question revolves around Roger Clemens and whether or not that hamstring will allow him to be effective but the fans here in Seattle are certainly ready to send it back to New York at one game apiece trying to tie it up against the defending world champion Yankees who actually lost the first game of last year's ALCS with Seattle then stormed back to win three in a row. So maybe that's the example that the Mariners are looking for. All they have to do is look over to that dugout and know it can be done. A comeback might be in order. Eventually, of course, the Yankees won that series in six games. Well, as a team, you don't win 116 games like the Mariners did this year without getting contributions from everybody. The biggest con con contributor as far as RBIs were concerned, was Brett Boone. And he's really the key to this series. If he doesn't start swinging the bat, they will continue to struggle offensively, as they have, in Lou Pinella's words, since the next to the last day of the year. They have just not scored runs like they did before that. Yeah, not a great time for Brett Boone to go into a slump, but just three for 24 in this postseason with 11 strikeouts. It's a 125 batting average. Chuck Knobloch ready to dig in in another moment or so. 
Let's get a look at the rest of the Yankees starting nine now. Knobloch will be in left field. He really outdueled Ichiro in the leadoff spot in game one, going three for five with a double and a run batted in. Jeter at short. Dave Justice again, the DH. Paul O'Neill is back out there in right field. He says he hates being the designated hitter. He can't get in a groove unless he's playing the outfield, and Torrey has him back out in right. I couldn't get over how happy they were for Chuck Knobloch yesterday. They felt like he is a big part of the offense, and he really set the tone for New York by swinging at the very first pitch of the game from Aaron Seeley and hitting a line drive for that base hit. He didn't score then. He didn't score all day, but he was constantly on base for the Yankees. The Mariners have taken a field. A couple of changes in their defensive alignment. Stan Javier is out there in left field tonight, and it'll be Mark McLemore and not Guillen at shortstop. Carlos Guillen yesterday. Boom, second base, USA. David Bell, third base, USA. Mark McLemore, shortstop, USA. Stan Javier, outfield, Dominican Republic. Mike Cameron, center fielder, United States of America. Ichiro Suzuki, right field, Japan. Dan Wilson, catcher, USA. Yesterday, Lou Pinella going with Carlos Guillen and Jay Buhner. That did not work. He had hoped to get a little bit of offense out of those guys. It didn't happen. He's going more so now with the speed of McLemore and Javier, maybe trying to create some runs. Well, unlike game one starter Aaron Seeley, Freddie Garcia has pitched some great playoff baseball against the New York Yankees. In last year's ALCS, Garcia was 2-0 with a 154 earned run average. And he's certainly an American League Cy Young Award candidate. He enjoyed a spectacular season. He's certainly a number one starter. He just turned 25 years of age on the sixth day of this month. And what is a number one starter? There are two things, Dave, that have to happen. You have to pitch a lot of innings. Well, Freddie Garcia led the American League in innings pitched. And you need a big difference between your wins and your losses. For a team to go into the postseason, they have to be over 500. At 18 and 6, Freddie Garcia did his part and is an established number one guy. 6'4, 235 pounds. His hometown, Caracas, Venezuela. Not blocked yesterday, swinging at the first pitch fastball from Aaron Seeley. This fastball will be about eight miles an hour harder from Freddie Garcia. And again, we'll keep an eye on the radar gun. The first pitch right across for a strike at 93 miles an hour. And the reason for that is he's going on three days rest. His manager, Lou Pinella, believes he'll have no problem with it. He said he's a big, strong kid. He can handle it. One ball, one strike on Knobloch. On deck, Jeter, and then David Justice. Knobloch a three for five, game one. And most of the Yankees believe that was the key to the offense yesterday. And he rips this one down into the corner, headed for the wall. He hooked it, and a little too much, a foul ball. Tim Welke right along that foul line, the left field umpire. But Knobloch able to jump on it, just as he did right away against Aaron Seeley yesterday. Well, it had the fans worried, but Chuck Knobloch knew it was going to be fouled from the very beginning. Take a look at it. He never even set the bat down. It kind of looked like the beginning, a little bit of what happened to Soriano yesterday. Only Soriano's ball was fair, and he was held to a single off a ball that hit off the top of the wall. The one-two pitch from Garcia outside. Wally Bell, the home plate umpire, he'll call the balls and strikes tonight. Knobloch has certainly gotten used to postseason play. This is his fourth consecutive ALCS since being acquired from the Minnesota Twins in 1998. He hasn't known anything else with the Yankees. The count is full, three and two. This is a typical Chuck Knobloch at bat. Whether he gets on base or not, he has done his job. This will be the sixth pitch in this at bat already from Freddy Garcia. The Yankees have seen all of his pitches. He's worked the count. It'll possibly show up later on in the game. Hit off the glove of Olerud and down the line. Ichiro to scoop it up. It'll be a base hit for Knobloch. So he has started the first two games of the 2001 ALCS with a single. And Knobloch is just an absolute nightmare for a guy trying to set up the defense against him. You saw him just miss an extra base hit 
pulling the ball down the left field line. Now he goes over the first baseman's head. He'll hit the ball wherever it's pitched. A good contact guy, a power type guy, only not so much as a home run, but as a gap type hitter. Well, four for six already in the American League Championship Series. And here's Jeter, who hit 311 during the regular season with 21 home runs. 0 for 5 in the first game yesterday. He's bunting. And Bell will scoop the fire to first base, almost taking Olerud off the bag. Down to second, moves Knobloch on the sacrifice. But almost a missed throw there by Bell. A look at the umpires now. I mentioned Wally Bell with the plate tonight. Gary Cedarstrom is the umpire at first base. Charlie Relaford at second. The veteran John Shulock at third base. Eddie Montague, who had the plate yesterday, is in right. Tim Welke along that left field line. That right there tells you that Derek Jeter does not feel good at home plate swinging the bat. He's hitting under 200 in his career against the starting pitcher Freddie Garcia and Jeter was 0 for 5 yesterday. So what does he do instead of thinking of himself. He thinks of the team. What's the best thing I can do for our ball club right now. Well it's to advance Chuck Knobloch in the scoring position for a guy like Dave Justice or maybe Bernie Williams next. Justice the designated hitter. And he takes strike one a runner at second base one down the Yankees trying to score right away. And I think it's a fair point Rick to talk about the top five in the Yankee batting order against Garcia. It's not just Jeter himself. The Yankees one through five hitters including Bernie Williams are a combined 10 for 66 against this right hander. A jam shot over with it. No double play softly hit by Justice sounded like he broke his bat. And no advance by Knobloch, two down. This crowd is already into this ball game. And the one way to fuel the fire is to strike out a guy to end the inning. Olerud just so smooth and so effortless with everything he does. It took him a long time to win a gold glove, which he did last year. I wouldn't be surprised if he wins the next three or four consecutive. Voted as the American League starting first baseman in the All-Star game, which was played right here in Seattle on July 10th. Well, Ichiro really helped a lot of that. Oh, he sure did. Because of everybody voting for him, they just looked down the line at the rest of the Mariners and punched their name as well. Bernie Williams, the center fielder. He hit 307 during the season with 94 runs batted in. Bernie always has enjoyed the ALCS stage prior to this year. A 386 average in these series with 16 runs batted in. He's trying to pick up Knobloch here with two down. Ball one strike on Bernie. Tino Martinez will hit next if given the chance. What makes Freddie Garcia so tough is that most starting pitchers just have one, maybe two above average pitches. He has got three. He's got a fastball that'll touch 98 99. He's got a changeup, which Bernie Williams just saw there. And his curveball has improved every single year. Knobloch leading at second. It's sharply down to get it over Rude, and the Gold Glover makes the play for number three. The Yankees do not score, and this crowd is really noisy in Seattle. The roof is on tonight. That's going to add to the bedlam at Safeco Field. The Mariners are coming up. Musino on the hill tonight for the Yankees and here is the Seattle lineup with Suzuki to kick it off. Very unfortunate for Seattle. Brett Boone's not swinging the bat well and Edgar Martinez is not at 100 percent. You have to think that groin injury is bothering him more than running even swinging the bat. He struck out twice yesterday and uncharacteristically of him he broke three bats in two at bats. Ichiro didn't break any bats, but he only wound up with one hit on the day, one for four. So the Yankees corralled the number one hitter in Major League Baseball pretty well. He was one for four with a double. But Joe Torre and Andy Pettit thought keeping Ichiro off base until the ninth inning was a major part of the Yankee win. Ichiro and fellow MVP candidate Brett Boone, two for seven. In a game one loss, and there's a swing and a miss. And quickly, he's in the hole on two. Right away, you see the same game plan they had yesterday. Even though Musina's going away, as opposed to Andy Pettit being a left-handed pitcher coming in, 
changing the eye levels. Fastball down to begin with. There was an elevated fastball. Either another elevated fastball here or that good breaking ball down in the dirt. You've seen it trying to put him away immediately, but it's flicked and filed away by Ichiro. Mark McLemore up next. Normally you wouldn't expect anything to happen in the first inning against Mike Mussina. He's not allowed a run in the first inning in his last 11 starts. Only once this year did he allow more than one run in the first inning. But those innings weren't against a, a team like Seattle and a guy named Ichiro. The 0 2 again is wide. And when you talk about efficiency, probably no more efficient pitcher in the American League, maybe in the majors, than Mike Mussina. Which brings a smile of El Stottlemyre's face without a doubt. 98 times this year, he retired the side in order. Tops in baseball. Pedro puts it in play up the middle and it gets by Jeter. His second hit of the series, but he starts the ball game with a base hit. Really surprised with the sequence there by Mike Mussina after he got ahead in the count. Let's take a look at it. First pitch fastball to Ichiro. All right, a little breaking ball on the outside corner. Now watch this. Look at him changing the eye level. Tries to go upstairs again. Ichiro is late on that pitch. There's another fastball. Now watch what he does. There's a changeup. When he was late on your fastball, why throw a changeup that gives him an opportunity to put it in play? He hit it on the ground, which he normally does. And it looks like that Seattle offense is off and running. And Ichiro may be two 56 stolen bases. Normally, if a guy's late on a fastball away, as Ichiro was on the pitch before that, you come in with that same fastball, he's going to be even later because you have to hit that fastball in out in front of home plate. So McLemore to step in with Ichiro on, and he's late on the first one, swinging a miss for strike one. Lou Pinella decided to start Carlos Guillen at shortstop in game one. He had been out for two and a half weeks battling tuberculosis. Ian went 0 for 3. He also missed a tag on Posada on a fourth inning double. Despite a perfect peg from Ichiro from right field. And that run later scored. So Guillen sits tonight. McLemore is hitting and he takes one up and away for a ball. It's one and one. That shows you the respect for the speed of Ichiro at first base. Joe Torre will not pitch out very often, particularly in the first inning, but already he called for a pitch out. That time it did not work. Now during the regular season, Seattle won 23 of the 30 times that McLemore started. But he started at shortstop. So he's been something of a good luck charm for them. He did not have a very good division series against the Cleveland Indians. He hit just a buck 67. But of course they won that series in five games. McLemore is one of those intangible guys. He plays the game of baseball with that name on the front of his jersey instead of the one on the back. Each year with the lead not running. And it's lined in the left. Knobloch charges to make the catch. And Ichiro fades back into first base. You saw Knobloch make the catch in left field, a converted second baseman. A look at the rest of the New York Yankee D. Really amazing what they do up Tino the Martinez, first base, United States of America. My name is Alfonso Soriano, second base for New York Yankee, and I'm from Dominican Republic. I'm Scott Brocious, third baseman, USA. Derek Jeter, shortstop. USA. Chuck Knobloch, left field, USA. Bernie Williams, center fielder, Puerto Rico. Paul O'Neill, right field, United States of America. Corey Posada, catcher, Puerto Rico. And Mike Mussina, the 32 year old from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, dealing to the native of Southern California, Brett Boone, a 331 hitter during the season. But his postseason has been dreadful in a word. Three for 24, 11 strikeouts. His first slump of the year, although his timing could be better. He's chosen postseason play to go into a bit of a tailspin. On the corner for a strike, nothing in two. Take a look at the location of this fastball here. Almost like it was in the pregame show. Wherever Posada puts his glove, that's where the baseball will end up. 
Ichiro again edging away from first base, and that one is lined to center into center field for a base hit. The second hit of the inning off Musina, Suzuki into second base. And there are two on for the designated hitter, Edgar Martinez. Second hit off Mike Musina, and the third consecutive ball that was hit hard. McLemore might have hit the ball the hardest of the three, but Chuck Knobloch was able to get a glove on it. We were worried about the velocity of Freddie Garcia pitching only on three days rest. But Mike Musina is the one whose velocity is down a little bit, and now he has given up both singles on an 0-2 count. And if there is a nemesis on the Seattle club for Mike Musina, it is this man, Edgar Martinez. 22 for 59 against him, a 373 lifetime average. He starts him with a breaking ball low, one to nothing. Those numbers are equally as amazing when you think about the fact he's got, this would be his 60th at bat against Mike Musina, so it's not like that 373 is over, you know, 10 or 12 at bats. This is more than a trend here. Two on, one out. A Mariner threatened in the first inning and a check swing. It's up and in, 2 and 0. Oh. Edgar had to go to the bat store to get some more bats after yesterday when he lost three of them. Andy Pettit claiming a couple of them. Mariano Rivera, the other, on the last play of the game. Ichiro and Boone get their leads. This crowd is buzzing in the first inning in Seattle. Brocious on to Soriano one and Martinez is easily doubled up. Five four three and that's a rally killer. That's the third double play he's hit into in his last two games. Edgar Martinez doubled up around the horn go the Yankees. And Seattle fails to score after an inning at Safeco. It's nothing, nothing. And without his bat, that offseason could happen sooner than the Mariners would like. So nothing, nothing after an inning. Tino Martinez laces a base hit between Bell and McLemore. The second Yankee hit of the night against Freddie Garcia. This one leading off the second inning. You know, every year they talk about some young prospect that's going to replace Tino Martinez. Well, there might be somebody that can replace him as far as on the field what he does. But Joe Torre was telling us before tonight's game, there's nobody that can replace him in that clubhouse. Joe Torre says that anytime problems come up with the team, as they do throughout the year, he said very seldom do they get to his office because guys like Tino are able to solve them and calm them down before they become a big deal. Well, the Yankees have Nick Johnson in the system. He would be the man to replace Tino if that should happen. He spent September with the Major League Ball Club up with New York. Tino, though, 34 homers, 113 runs batted in during the regular season. The Yankees doing a wonderful job, Rick, of starting innings by reaching base. They did it six times in yesterday's game one victory, and they've done it twice in two innings here tonight. A lot of them swinging at that first pitch fastball. Osana lays off and it's outside one and one. There's Nick Johnson the big first baseman big time power. They expect 25 to 30 homers a year out of him a tremendous on base percentage for a power type guy but where he needs help right now is defensively. One thing the Yankees like about him is how patient he is especially given his youth. Uh, he will work a count and Boy, hit fit right in with the rest of the Yankees, given that description. That's been their calling card as a ball club offensively throughout this amazing championship run, having won four of the last five world titles. Slap foul by Posada. He was one for three in the first game with a double and a walk, and he also scored two of the Yankees' four runs. And even more importantly than that, Posada was proud of his fingers, he said, before tonight's game. The pitches that he called for Andy Pettit to throw. The 
crowd eager for a strikeout from Garcia and time asked for and granted by Wally Bell to Posada. And Garcia not very happy about that. Posada had lost his rhythm at home plate. Asked for timeout. He was granted it. Dan Wilson threw up his arm, but Garcia did not see it until he had started to throw the pitch. A batter can ask. The umpire does not have to grant it. It's solely up to him. Full count, 3 2. That might have been a little message from young Freddy Garcia. He will intimidate you if you let him. I won't be the only hitter tonight that he knocks down. Try to knock him off the plate. If they give, they move off the plate. He'll take advantage of him on the outer half. The runner goes in the 3-2, and it's ball four. Now, the previous fastball, 95 miles an hour by Garcia. Then he came back with the off-speed pitch. And we said we'd keep an eye on the radar gun readings to see how hard he was throwing on three days rest. So far, so good. And that's what Pinella was betting on. Well, they just have a better game plan right now, that being the Yankee hitters, than those of Lou Pinellas. They have not hit into a double play as of yet in this series. They're very patient. They know to hit into a double play. More times than not, you're going to do it on a pitch down. They're not swinging at those pitches. Paul O'Neill certainly came into this series slumping. He was tied up in a major way by the Oakland A's in the division series, managing to go just one for 11. It does not appear O'Neill is in a slump any longer. He has two on here with nobody out and fouls the first one away. And here's how he broke out of that little postseason skid yesterday. Well, he said the reason he was able to go out of the park was because the ball was up. And you can see Aaron Seeley knew right away. Very respectful, as all of these Yankee hitters are when they hit a home run. O'Neill not standing there admiring it, tucked his head down and got around the bases. So early on a chance to put the Yankees in front here in the second game. The 0 1 from Garcia too high. Freddie Garcia topping the American League and earned run average with a 3 0 5 ERA. So for Pinella he has emerged as a true ace. The league also hit just 225 against him. And he pitched 238 plus innings. Was also number one in the American League. So across the board, you're looking at a real number one here. Martinez and Posada leading in a high fly lifted to Stan Javier. And the veteran of 17 major league seasons hauls it in for the first down to second inning. That's a rare bat at bat for the Yankees there. The game plan for O'Neill with nobody out was to pull the baseball. Try to advance Tino Martinez at least to third base with just one out. But Garcia did not give him a pitch to do that with, and Paul can't be very happy with his effort there. So now a double play can get Garcia out of the inning. After retiring O'Neill on a routine fly, brings up Scott Brocious. Brocious 0 for 3 yesterday. Garcia has really tossed a wet blanket over his bats in the past. He's one out of 11 against the right-hander. And he is having a pretty bad postseason so far, but that'll take care of it. Down into the corner, this will be an extra base hit. Here comes Martinez into score. Posada into third. He's being waved around as it bounces away from Javier. Down into the corner, and that's a two-run double. Crunched by Scott Brocious, and then he got a good bounce. He got a Yankee hop down into the left field corner. It rattled away from Javier. And instead of just Martinez, Posada came screaming around. And Lou Pinella's team is already in the hole 2-0. There are some tough angles, particularly down the lines here at Safeco. And Stan Javier, you would think by now, would have the home field advantage, would know where this ball is going to come off. But he overran it. Then he slipped. By the time he got back, the Yankees had another run on the board. He went far too deep into that corner to play that kind of a carom. So two runs cross the plate. And once again, Safeco is quiet. As Soriano, who might be a huge key to this series, as the number nine hitter, 268 during the regular season with 18 homers, two for four with a stolen base yesterday. And that on a pitch out. And he stole it by 15 feet. 
What a big hit for Scott Brocious, who was one for 20 in the postseason before that double. That's got to be some concern for the Mariners, and in particular, Lou Pinella and their pitching coach, Brian Price. There have been a lot of balls hit hard. As we look at Brian there, he knows this is not the norm for Freddy Garcia. That three days rest may not have worked. Soriano fouls it away. Now he had a heck of a day yesterday, but one embarrassing moment, very un-Yankee like, came on his base hit, which he tore into down the left field line. He thought the ball was gone, and he hovered around the plate for a bit. It slammed into the fence. It went for a very long single. He thought it was out of the ballpark. Joe Torre said that kept me from having a great day. Otherwise, everything was perfect. Pop to center. And Cameron back lining it up. And Brocious will not try and tag up. He remains at second base. Two down. Joe Torre also said after the game and the excitement of winning game one in the ALCS, first thing he did was bring his young second baseman in along with the veteran Bernie Williams. Joe said that was his interpreter just in case his words were not understood to clear the air. Joe said even if that ball did go out of the ballpark that's not the way we react as a Yankee. I wouldn't expect to see it again. No message delivered. I think pretty clearly. So two down here's Knobloch batting for the second time already a single in the first inning for Chuck. So he's one for one. His numbers against Oakland in the division series 273 but six hits in those five games already has four of them in the ALCS. Brocious at second with two down and it's low for ball. You know Brocious is another guy just like Tino Martinez that there is talk about the youngster going to replace him next year. The youngster for Brocious is a guy named Drew Henson. George Steinbrenner spent 17 million on over the next six years. You gotta figure George is going to want to see that guy in uniform in New York. Another one hit hard into center. Here comes Cameron. Did he make the catch? No, he did not. Here it comes the run. He scores. He scores. Cameron scooped it up off the deck, and it's three to nothing Yankees. Cameron hopping mad. He thought the catch had been made. But it bounced on the grass. In for a hit. Another RBI for Knobloch. We take a look. And I think it's a bad judgment on the part of Mike Cameron by trying to play center field and umpire. We'll take a good look at it here. To me, to begin with, it looked like it dropped, and it did drop. That's a tremendous call from a long ways away by Ed Montague down the right field line. He tried to sell the fact that he caught it. But even if you did catch it and the umpire makes that call, you've got to come up and try to throw the guy out at home plate. That was Scott Brocious running from second. He doesn't have a lot of speed. You might have got him at home. Then let the umpire make the call after you make the throw. So that mental mistake, along with the physical mistake down in the left field corner by Javier, allowing that ball to get by him on the two-run double by Brocious, two early mistakes in the Seattle outfield, they were the top defensive team in the American League this year. They just don't make these kind of mistakes. Remember Guillen failing to properly cover second base on the double by Posada yesterday. He did not straddle the bag. And Posada slid in. He got by him when he should have been out on a great throw by Ichiro. So the Mariners are hurting themselves in the first two games of the ALCS. And New York leads it three to nothing. The runner goes. The throw by Wilson. The tag down in time. Knobloch cut down on a great throw by Wilson. That ends the inning. But the Yankees scored three times on a pair of singles and a big two run double by Scott Brocious and some charitable defense by the Seattle Mariners. Mike Cameron in center field holding it up, but he did not make. Well, Lou Pinella. Has his team down already three to nothing as we move to the bottom half of the second inning. Mike Cameron certainly part of the Yankee rally there. Eddie Montague, who is umpiring right field, came over in between innings to talk about the play where Cameron thought he made a catch in center field, explaining it to Lou Pinella. Now 
Knobloch creeps over to the line to make the catch, and Olerud is retired on one pitch. Looked like the proper call given all the replays we showed you from Montague. And you know what that shows me there is the respect that Montague has for Lupinella. He came over and said, you know what, I'm not positive. Check the replay and let me know if I got it right. I hustled, I got as close to the play as I could possibly get, and I made the best call I could make. And once again with Ed Montague, it was the right call. One of the reasons, and there are many, that there are two additional umpires in postseason play, one along the right field line, one along the left field line, to help on controversial plays like that. It appeared he got it right. Mike Cameron taking a strike, trying to atone for his mental lapse there. In failing to come up throwing on Brocious, who is not Alfonso Soriano in terms of wheels, who scored on that play. So the Yankees ahead three to nothing. This does not bode well for Seattle because Musina, in his last 12 starts, including the playoff outing against Oakland, only once has allowed more than three runs. Seven out of his last 10 appearances, Mike Musina has not allowed even one earned run. Go to pitch fly deep to left field, but playable. Knobloch backing up shy of the track. Two down. Well, Mike Mussina is certainly the thinking man's pitcher. He graduated from Stanford with a degree in economics, and he achieved that in three and a half years, less than four full years in college. He came within one out of recording baseball's 16th perfect game on September 2nd at Fenway Park. Allowing a two out single to Carl Everett in the bottom of the ninth inning. He came that close. Four career one hitters. Got to believe he'll get one one of these days. He's allowed a couple of hits tonight. Stan Javier, a 292 hitter during the season. And imagine that. A first pitch strike from Mike Mussina. That is now six out of seven that he has done that with. Looking for a one, two, three inning. Ichiro got on base as a leadoff hitter, but that's Ichiro. He does things that most people can't. Seventy-seven percent of the time this year, Mike Mussina retired the leadoff hitter. The only Yankee with a better percentage than that is their closer, Mariano Rivera. So far tonight, the Yankees are scoring for Mike Mussina. That's not something they made a regular habit of doing during the regular season, nor did his Baltimore Orioles teams throughout his superb seasons. Pitching in Camden Yards. How about his last year with the Orioles? A year ago, an ERA of 3.79, and an 11 and 15 record. I guess I guess that means it's time to leave. <laughs> well, he came to the right place. He wanted to play in October, so he went to the Yankees. He said a big factor in making his decision when he became a free agent as to where he'd be playing was whether or not he'd be playing in October. He said when I sat around and looked at the possibilities where and who in the core group of players it became obvious. And here he is pitching in October in meaningful games fouled off and got a piece of the home plate up Wally Bell two and two. You see it's just another reason why in my opinion the MVP of the Yankees for the last five years is their owner George Steinbrenner. I mean, how many teams can go out and spend that kind of money to bring a guy like Yusina in? It was Roger Clemens that he brought in a few years ago. He added Chuck Knobloch. It seems like anything they need, but Steinbrenner is more than willing to write the check to get him. And some big checks for people like Chuck Knobloch and Bernie Williams when they re-signed him, Rivera when they re-signed him. Base is empty, two down. And the pitch to Javier. Just wide. Dan Wilson will be the next hitter. So far, the Mariners have been shut out by Messina. Held the two runs yesterday by Pettit and Rivera, a Seattle team that scored the most runs in the big leagues this year, allowing the fewest and committing the fewest errors of any major league team. But they're not scoring yet in this series. They are making defensive mistakes. And the Yankees are clearly out pitching them. And I think that not scoring has something to do with the defensive lapses that we've seen from this team. They're pressing right now. No one knows it better than their manager. A 
Javier battling Musina. The three and two slice back to the screen. So he's making the veteran Musina work here. And Stan Javier certainly fits that bill, 37 years old. Take a look at this 3 2 pitch. Look at where Posada sit. First, the baseball. That is amazing command of that fastball. Musina, not only smart, as you mentioned, with that Stanford degree, but equally as talented. He has thrown eight pitches to Javier in this at bat. And he walks it. So, a man on for Seattle. Major League Baseball International's presentation of the 2001 American League Championship Series is brought to you by MasterCard. There are some things in life that money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Rick Sutcliffe, Dave O'Brien from Safeco Field in Seattle, Washington. The roof covering us tonight. They are anticipating rain. It is gray, cloudy, and cool outside. But the great thing about Safeco is you can still see outside. It's not one of those retractable domes that makes you feel like you're inside a giant hangar. You can see the skyline and you can feel the chill. There are so many beautiful things here to see in Seattle as well. The new football stadium that's going up right across the street. Mount Rainier, the Space Needle we saw earlier. Why not give the fans a view? But as long as it's a covered view because it tends to rain now and again. Dan Wilson, a 265 hitter during the season, 0 for 3 yesterday in the first game. And Musina falls behind him 2 0 after walking Stan Javier. Doesn't really look like Mel Stoudemire's too concerned, does he? Musina doesn't make many mistakes. It was a terrific at bat by Stan Javier. He's more of a guy that works the count, but will have a higher on base percentage than yesterday's left fielder, Jay Buhner. Just 42 walks from Usina during the season. His fewest since 1998. That was his first walk tonight. A foul ball by Wilson, who in the playoffs against the Yankees has had a very difficult time. Both in 95 and last year, 1995, he was two out of 17 against them. Last year, one for 11. He's got some decent career numbers though against Mike Mussina along with that 261 average. He's hit three home runs. The Yankees up three zip in the second. And it's off the end of the bad foul. Mussina made two starts against the Mariners during the regular season. He went one and one. A 338 earned run average. Seattle hit him pretty well. He batted 306 off him. But he also tallied 15 strikeouts in 13 in the third innings. He did not give up a home run in either of those two outings. A lot of strikeouts from him. Wilson gets a bit of it. Two and two. On August 17th, in this ballpark, he picked up a win. In an outstanding outing, five hits over seven innings, and he struck out seven. Javier edges away from first, and another 2 2 pitch is swatted down the left field line, but foul. Hit very sharply. The Mariners have had some pretty good cuts against Musina in the first two innings. Well, he's, he's been wild, but for the most part, in the first inning, he was wild in the strike zone, giving up a couple of hits on 0 2 pitches. Very uncharacteristic of him. Well, Wilson was fooled to begin with. You saw him rock back, thinking that ball was in on him. It ended up being that big breaking curveball. And even though his part, front part of his body was gone, his hands were back. Well, that was his 20th pitch of this inning, so he is laboring some. They're making him work. That's got to put somewhat of a smile on Luke Manella's face, particularly the way this offense has struggled. They scored one run in the next to last game of the year. They scored four runs the last day of the year. Shut out in the first game against Cleveland. Another foul ball, so he has thrown eight pitches to Dan Wilson after needing nine against Javier. And that clicker is going pretty good. 
Stottlemyre keeping track of the pitches. The Safeco fans looking for a two out rally here. One on, two out. Three nothing New York in the second inning. Popped it up, drifting into foul ground and again into the stands. Wilson just laying that bat out there, spoiling one pitch after another, looking for something to handle. And it's one different pitch after another from Mike Yoshina. He's fouled off the curveball. There was a changeup he got a piece of. He's been right on the fastball. Now what do you do if you're Mike Yoshina? I might tell him what's coming. <laughs> Sada wants that fastball in and he wants to elevate it. Let's see if Wilson chases it. He lines it into right center field for a base hit. O'Neill tries to cut it off. He does. He flips it to Williams. Here comes Javier into third. What a play by Paul O'Neill. But it's a base hit for Wilson after a long, long at bat, and the Mariners have met on the corners. That should have been an RBI double. But exactly like you said, Dave, that was a tremendous play by Paul O'Neill. And let's not forget, he has got a stress fracture in that left foot. He said, I don't know if it's still broke or not. I don't care. I don't want to find out. I want to play. Yeah, it bothers him. He said, in particular, it bothers him taking that first step defensively. Well, if he didn't take a tremendously quick first step there, that ball would have gotten by him. Seattle would have been on the board. But they're not. And don't seem to be surprised if they don't score with two outs here and Mike Yoshida on the mound. Well, quite a contrast to the way the Mariners have played the outfield. We'll see how long O'Neill can go tonight as David Bell takes the first pitch for ball one. It's at around the six-inning mark, Lou Pinella told us, that O'Neill's stress fracture really starts to ache. It starts to bark at him. Of course, he did damage before he came out of the game yesterday, cranking a two-run homer, and he just made a wonderful play on a toss over to Williams to prevent a run from scoring. Ichiro up next. And it's hammered into the ground by David Bell, a big hitter here, because the Mariners hope they have Mucina on the ropes. Sort of taking some time to go out and talk to Mike Mucina. That was signaled from Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach. Not for anything else other than just give him time to regroup a little bit. This is on postseason play. The Mariners have had a very difficult time batting with men in scoring position. Javier unable to score on a hit by Wilson. First and third, two down. The 1 1 pitch fouled off. You've seen it so far. Having a, a very difficult time putting away Seattle hitters. When the count has gone to two strikes, he's allowed three hits and he's walked a man. Seattle has done a good job laying off the high fastball. You've seen has tried to expand the zone a couple of times in that location, but they have not gone for it. Bell waiting on a one two pitch. Two and two. There it was again. Boy, Rick, a lot of pitches in this inning. Yusina only needed four pitches to retire the first two batters. To the last three hitters, 23 pitches. One of the goals for the Seattle Mariners coming into tonight's game was to get Mendoza into this ball game. They feel like he's a little bit fatigued. Joe Torrey had to have him up and throwing three times yesterday, although he didn't get into the ball game. Full count. Fish aren't biting. Thus far, they've done a tremendous job laying off that high fastball. What a wonderful baseball town this is. And they're letting the world hear him right here. One more bad one, and they're loaded up for Ichiro. Here's the 3-2. Struck him out. Bell went after the high one. And Mucina fans him. 
Seattle can't break through against Mussina. Paul O'Neill with a gorgeous play out in right field. He prevented a run. Three nothing the Yankees. Due to time constraints, we now move ahead in this ESPN program. ALCS game number two, three nothing to Yankees. And Rick, the Yankees are nothing if they're not a club that picks each other up. Well, and, and that's what Joe Torre's teams are all about. You've got 25 guys pulling on the same side of that rope. And even though Bernie let go of the rope for a minute, look at the guys there to pick him up. Look at who they are. Patting him on the back. Look at Tino Martinez. Now let's get going. We don't need you down. And what happens after Bernie gets a drink and he gets a towel? He follows the starting pitcher, Mike Mussina, down into the runway to tell him I'm sorry. And I know Mussina. I played with him. He says, no big deal. I picked you up. I know you'll be there for me later on. And the Yankees still on top by three. Mussina continues to throw a shutout, although not a work of art by any means. Freddie Garcia, on the other hand, is allowed three runs, four hits. And despite the great catch by Cameron in center field, his defense has let him down as well in the outfield. Posada not real thrilled with that strike call by Wally Bell. He walked and scored in the second inning. One and two. Posada, as being a catcher, though, won't argue a whole lot about that call. One thing he probably said to Wally Bell was, All right, if you're going to call that a strike on me with a bat in my hand, make sure my pitcher gets that pitch. Down into the dirt by Garcia. That squares the count at two and two. In this inning, Posada, O'Neill, and Brocious, six, seven, and eight. And Alfonso Soriano, the number nine man, if anybody reaches, it was this part of the order that did considerable damage to Seattle yesterday. Ground ball with foul, backhanded by Olderud in any event. The count remains two and two. I'll never forget a few years ago. In fact, it was on July 31st, 1998, when Seattle traded Randy Johnson to the Houston Astros. And boy, did their front office take a beating in the press and in the media. We got nothing in return for the big unit. And they couldn't have been more wrong. Cut on and miss for strike three. That's part of what they got. A terrific young pitcher. He strikes out the leadoff man. One away in the fourth inning. Where can you see some of baseball's greatest plays of the week? How'd you like to get some tips from the game's best players? Well, be sure to tune into Baseball Max. Each week, Baseball Max brings you the excitement and drama of the game of baseball. Upcoming episodes will recap the 2001 playoffs, including this series and the World Series. Baseball Max, check the TV listings in your country for times and channels. A worldwide audience tuning in. We thank you for joining us tonight for ALCS Game 2. O'Neill punches a single up the middle. Swinging at the first pitch. Paul O'Neill with his first hit of the night. Well, many were ready to write the Yankees off, and I think maybe Paul O'Neill was the poster child for the write off. As his numbers declined this year, the stress fracture in the foot at the end of the year shelved him for a bit as well. But in this series, he has hammered a two run homer. Tonight, a wonderful play in right field. After scooping a ball in the alley and shoveling it over to Williams on the run. And now he's one for two in this one. They just keep coming at you, that being the Yankees. They've, they've kept the pressure on Seattle this whole series. Only one inning have the Yankees gone one, two, three. Lou Pinella says they are the cat with nine lives. You just can't get rid of them. They keep coming back. He said, You can beat the Yankees, they are beatable. Not that anyone's figured it out in postseason recently. But to do it, you got to score on their starting pitching. Check swing by Brocious. He doubled in a couple of runs in the second inning. So maybe he is off the schneid. The MVP of the 1998 World Series against San Diego. And what a series he had. Hitting 471 with six runs batted in. He went eight for 17 in that series. And he's also sprung to life. Maybe out of a slump. Here in game two. At the knees for a strike, one and one. We talked to Joe Torre about Scott Brocious. He says, forget the numbers. He said, all you need to say about him is that he came to New York three years ago. And since then, 
We've won three World Series, heading for a fourth. Not a lot of hits, but big hits. Like those ones you mentioned in the 98 World Series. Well, and he's been a standout defensive third baseman throughout his career. He hasn't had a great year with the glove, but very reliable. And he cut and missed. The count goes to one and two. That really has been surprising when you look at it. 120 games played for Gross. 22 errors for him. But just like Derek Jeter, a lot of those coming in the early part of the year, April and May. This team doesn't look at the season as a 162 game year. They, they figure there's 180 games in it for them. Well, it always is for Jeter. Every single season, he's going to play in about 185 games. A little bit low for a ball. And Reggie Jackson was talking about that yesterday, Mr. October. When somebody asked him about Derek Jeter, and he said, he doesn't understand the game of Major League Baseball because he thinks the season goes 180 games every year. It's only supposed to be 162, but for Derek Jeter, it's not. The two and two on Grocious. Close play, got him. O'Neill picked off. He did not slide. Olerud got the tag on him. Pretty cagey toss over there by Garcia, round number two. Well, he couldn't slide. And he couldn't take that first step because when he put pressure on that stress fracture to come back, it did not respond. He just couldn't move. This wasn't because it was a great move. It was it was a quick move. It was a good throw, but it was a guy physically not able to get back. But Paul O'Neill, usually a standout base runner, unable to do what he normally could because of the injury. And down goes Brosius, a swing and a miss for strike three. But Garcia did a lot of that himself. Two strikeouts and a pickoff. Paul O'Neill sent to the bench. You can see he's in some pain. Olerud gets him on the back foot. And Brocious strikes out to end the inning. And through three and a half at Safeco, the Yankees still lead it. Three to nothing.